If you want to learn to make chocolate at home, you've probably seen one of these guys, a melanger, and at some point, you've been using your oven. That's really the great way to start with roasting your beans to get them ready to be ground up and made into chocolate. But when you want to upgrade the roast, when you want a little bit more control over your roast, you've got to go barrel roasting. There's a lot of ways to do it, but in today's episode of Craft Chocolate Test Kitchen, we're going to talk about how to barrel roast over your stove and why it allows you greater control over your roast. As I said in the intro, welcome to Craft Chocolate Test Kitchen. I'm Jesse Fung, and today we're going to be roasting these beans from Colombia. If you saw my very first episode of the show, uh, you know I used these to make a dark milk chocolate. Um, as it is live, you're in the middle of that process, so thanks for joining me for this one. Uh, but we're going to take these and we're going to barrel roast them. That means instead of trying to play around with the oven, we get a lot more control over exactly what we're gonna be doing with the beans and how to get them to their end of run temperature. Now, we're not gonna talk about uh, how to set up the perfect uh, roast profile. That is a little more involved than I can explain at this point. I'm still experimenting with this bean, with the other beans that I have in terms of developing different roast profiles, but we're gonna go over the basics in what is involved with a drum roaster, and then how you can use your stove or an outdoor grill or something where you have control over the heat to actually get your beans where you wanna go in the right amount of time with the right amount of heat at the right time. So here we are with my barrel roaster. I found this from a supplier in China. Um, I'm used to sourcing things in China, but we can talk about uh, the business side of things in a, another video if you want to. Um, so. I got this specifically because I knew that it would roast about a kilo at a time. I can do a little more than a kilo, um, probably a kilo and a quarter I can get away with in this particular roaster, but I like doing kilo batches because I like to make lots of different kinds of chocolate. Um, hence this YouTube channel where we experiment with chocolate and figure out what works, what doesn't work, what goes terribly awry, and then make some conclusions and figure out how to make things delicious. So uh, I got this barrel roaster because I want to get a little more serious about the hobby and we know that we can get a lot more control with the barrel roaster itself. Now, I'm gonna be doing uh, one kilo in here today, and that means we need to figure out how much heat do we actually need to input to get where we wanna go. Um, if you watched my first video where I talked about dark milk chocolate, I mentioned John Nancy, the founder of Chocolate Alchemy. He has so much good information. He's a retired chemist, so he really goes into the kind of nitty gritty side, all the math stuff, which as a mathematician, I appreciate. Um, and so this tip kind of comes from him or this information comes from him. So check him out. He's got a YouTube channel as well. Uh, but we know that uh, basically ambient temperature here, we'll say 70. Uh, I think if I look at my thermometer, it's actually 64 in here. So, but ballparking 70. And we typically wanna to go to an end of roast temperature, somewhere around 250 Fahrenheit. To do that, we have to go um, with 425 BTUs per pound. Now, we're working in kilos or we're working in pounds, we're gonna do some conversions, but it's easy. Uh, pounds, kilos, there's 2.2 pounds in a kilo. So 2.2 times 425, we need 935 BTUs to actually get us where we wanna go. Now, the question is, how the hell does that help us? What can we do uh, to figure out how this barrel roaster is actually going to get us to the end temperature? Well, that's a little simple um, in that if we think about what do our burners have going on, then we can decide which burner to use, how much time and how much burner to actually be using it. Um, so for our stove here, uh, we upgraded a couple of years ago when we renovated the kitchen. We have selections anywhere between 500 BTUs to 20,000 BTUs. Um, and that quote of BTUs, British Thermal Units, it's BTUs per hour, which is important to us because we need to know exactly 
how long do we want to roast for? And that takes into account where we need to set our dial. Because if we're going to set our dial higher, we're obviously going to be roasting for a shorter amount of time because we're putting in more heat. But we can be more precise. So I've actually chosen the 9000 BTU burner in the middle of our range. Um, and that is going to get me where I want to go because we know, as mentioned, we need to do 935 BTUs to go from 70 to 250 with the beans. So with a 9,000 BTU burner, that's 9,000 per hour, if we want to roast in 20 minutes, we've had to figure out, okay, how many BTUs are available to us? 20 minutes is a third of an hour. A third of 9,000 is 3,000. So I have 3,000 BTUs available to me maximum in a 20 minute period. So if I want to get 935 out of it, I divide 935 by 3,000, and then I get roughly a third. It's like 31% or something like that, which means on my nice dial here behind me, behind my shoulder that ignites this particular burner, I know that I can basically set it to a three, and it's gonna take me from where I wanna go at the beginning to the end run temperature of 250 in about 20 minutes. Now I mentioned this at the beginning of the video where we're not gonna be talking about exact roast profiles. This is something I'm still experimenting with and we'll do a video on this in the future where we kind of get into the nitty gritty of how we change the roast profile. This particular roast profile is linear in that we're gonna set a charge temperature, meaning we're gonna bring the temperature of the barrel itself up to about 350. We're gonna dump the beans in and then I'm gonna set it on three and let it ride. So this is where the temperature is going to basically move in a linear fashion, which is a straight line on a graph. Whereas a lot of people suggest, okay, let's go like higher fast and then slow it off. We can get into that. It's going to take a little bit more math, a little bit more working to figure out, hey, if I want to turn my dial up to five and really ramp up the temperature fast to be in the beginning, where do I cut it off? What do I dial it back to? And I think that's a little beyond the scope of this particular video, um, but that's what we're going to do with this. So. Let's get the beans in here um, and then we'll get going. So first I'm gonna set my charge temperature. We're gonna get some B-roll, some music, um, and then we'll pull the beans out at the end and you know see and smell. And I'll probably talk a little bit as it's roasting um, so we can talk about what's going on, what I'm smelling at various temperatures. So we've hit our charge temperature of 350. That's the temperature, the air temperature inside the roaster. Now it's time to get it stopped, get it loaded, and then set it and let it roast. So um, we'll get it loaded and then we'll talk about kind of what we're smelling at various points from room temperature till about at least 170, 180. I don't usually smell a ton, um, but we'll see with this bean whether we see something different because I haven't actually done it in the barrel roaster yet. So here we are, like seven, eight minutes in, passing about 120, see if we can focus on that, um, 120, 125 degrees Fahrenheit, just starting to get just the faintest amount of cocoa smell. Um, it's always easier when I leave the room, come back, when I'm in the room the whole time, I don't usually smell it yet. Um, so we'll check back in, it's gonna be again, we start getting around 180 to 200. That brownie smell really starts coming in. Um, and then we know we're you know, cooking with fire, so to speak. So I'm gonna let it keep going. It's gonna be, we're gonna be back here in four or five minutes or so. So now we're passing about 180, like I talked about. And this interestingly, as I'm really paying attention, starting to get more like fudgy notes and Almost as I mentioned, this bean's supposed to have like a whiskey and a caramel kind of thing. Getting a little bit of maybe the astringency off the bean, which is that kind of vinegary, uh, alcoholy almost smell. 
and then just fairly, just a sugary, caramelly kind of note too. Um, so it's kind of interesting as you really pay attention. When we come to the end of the roast uh, here soon, just a few more minutes. Um, and so when we get there, I'm gonna pull the roaster off. We're gonna dump the beans out and then I'm gonna stick them outside uh, so they can cool down pretty rapidly. It's, I think, 25, maybe 26 degrees outside. Um, and that's the best way I have to cool them down right now. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you can apply this in different kinds of setups you can use. So I put the beans outside to cool down after we hit our end of run temperature. What we were smelling, or what I was smelling, you weren't smelling anything, unfortunately, right at the end, right as we get to like 250, that's when I start to smell. It's, it's very brownie-like, because brownies almost are like burnt chocolate. It's like the beginning of burnt. Now you don't want it burnt, because then you've gone too far. That's when you're starting 260, 270, 280, you're starting to get a little more like burnt, burny notes, um, which is not gonna taste good. You don't want burnt chocolate. Um, but it, it's right at that edge. If you've ever made caramel um, and you've toasted sugar, so it's the same kind of deal, at least for me, olfactory-wise, smell-wise, right when you hit that uh, slightly burnt sugar uh, part when you're making caramel and you're dumping the cream in, that is the kind of same thing right where we're hitting that right good end of temperature thing uh, with, the co with the cocoa. So... Uh, barrel roasting at home, you know, obviously you can try to pick up something like this. There's stuff like that on Amazon. Um, I found it from, like I said, a, a Chinese supplier. Um, there are a number of things I would fix about this if I was designing my own roaster and getting it made. Um, but you can also uh, get barrel roasters um, that you could take outside, you know, rotisseries that you can put in your grill outside. I like this because I live in the Midwest and it is cold in the winter, so I don't necessarily want to be outside. Um, and just knowing I have a little bit more control over that. Even that being said, we took a little bit longer to get to temperature today than I did when I tested this out when I first got it in. It was almost 20 minutes on the dot um, the first time I tested it out. Today, I think we have a little bit cooler air temperature in here, um, so I think I was losing a little bit of heat. Um, but altogether, if you want to go barrel roasting, you're going to get a lot more control over your beans and you're gonna be able to do a lot more of that art side of single origin chocolate and being able to control that roast profile. Now that you have a basic idea of how to take your barrel roaster and what you need to do to calculate kind of the basic linear path that your, your beans are gonna take on a particular burner. Um, obviously, I'm using gas. I'd love to know if you have an electric stove or an induction stove or some kind of stove top, you know, one of those glass stove tops, whatever it is, something that's not gas. If you have a barrel roaster and you've tried it, leave it down in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you and your experience uh, with that particular kind of setup since I'm not familiar and you may be able to help somebody else out. If you want more videos, you like chocolate, hit subscribe, stick around with me for more videos in the future where again, we're gonna experiment with figuring out how to make delicious new things, trying out wacky experiments, new ingredients, all those kind of things um, that maybe you wouldn't think to do on your own. You can watch me do it and then figure out, hey, did it work? Was it a disaster? And what do we learn? So I'll hopefully see you next time on the next episode of Craft Chocolate Test Kitchen.